Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, May the 7th. Today's topic is Kids Deserve It. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning, and Paula Noggle. Our special guests today are Todd Nisloni and Adam Welcome. Paula is going to be introducing our special guests as well as asking them the newbie questions. I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula. Good morning, everyone. This is Paula Noggle from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm <clears throat> sorry for my scratchy voice, but I did a lot of cheering yesterday as my kids uh, went on to win first place in our field day. And we had a beautiful day for it, but I am so excited to be here this morning and to introduce these two gentlemen who are going to talk about their Kids Deserve It initiative. Let me start with Todd. Todd Nesloni is the principal lead learner of Webb Elementary in Navasota, Florida, um, I'm sorry, Texas. <laughs> he is the 2015 BAMI Award recipient for elementary principals and the 2014 BAMI Award winner for Classroom Teacher of the Year. He's also been the TCEA Teacher of the Year in 2014, a White House Champion of Change, a National School Board Association's 20 to Watch, and Center for Digital Education, Top 40 Innovators in Education. Todd is the author of the children's books, Bruce and Lucy, and the co-author of the award-winning book, Flipping 2.0. He is also the co-host of the popular educational podcast series, Edu All-Stars and Kids Deserve It. I first met Todd in person several years ago at the TCEA Area 7 Conference in White Oaks, Texas, where we were both presenting. I was immediately captivated by his enthusiasm and warmth. He and I became fast friends, and I'm always excited when I get to see Todd present in person, such as in April when we both attended the same conference in Houston. Adam Welcome is the principal of Monterre Elementary School in Danville, California. He is a marathon runner, a workshop fan, a husband, and a father of two children. He serves on the Remind Advisory Board was a 20 to watch technology leader for the National School Board Association this year, is a Q Rockstar admin faculty member, and is the ASCA Principal of the Year. Adam is also co-host of the podcast series, Kids Deserve It. I look forward to the day when I get to meet Adam in person, but until that time, I follow him on social media and I'm always inspired by all that he does. It is my great pleasure to now turn things over to our guests for today's webinar, Adam Welcome and Todd Nesloni, and they will now answer this newbie question. What inspired you to create the Kids Deserve It initiative? Well, Paula, thank you so much for that great uh, welcome and those great uh, introductions. I, I love Paula, and so I, it was great to have you introduce us. Um, but you know, this initiative that Adam and I started uh, came from both of us attending the National Principal Conference in Long Beach, California this past summer. Adam, do you kind of want to give a little bit? Well, I was going to talk about how we were at dinner with Remind, and you kind of stalked me a little bit at dinner. And then, uh, to be fair, Todd started tweeting. Um, <laughs> and we were at dinner talking about uh, something that I said that, that Todd tweeted, and um, uh, our conversation just took off. Um, and uh, the next morning, we met for breakfast at like 6.30 in the morning, which is really early for Todd, and uh, we wrote a blog post right. together. You want to talk about that, Todd? Yeah, so Adam always gave me a hard time about not blogging enough, and so um, when we were together, I was like, let's write a post together, and we wrote a post um, kind of that led into Kids Deserve It, and it was such an easy experience for both of us to write together 
that Adam and I both looked at each other and said, I think we're on to something. Let's take this idea of, of kids and kids deserving our best all the time and let's run with it. And that kind of led into a Twitter account, a Facebook, a hashtag, um, which then exploded into a book deal, a website, um, and then the, just this movement from other educators. You know, and the big thing with, with the relationship that Todd and I have is, uh, you know, we had not ever met. We had, I had, had not even known Todd a year. We met last June. And uh, mm -hmm. really just the, the energy that we both have, um, like we can just sit down on the phone or Google Hangout and just knock things out. And our, our, our mindset is so similar. Um, and really the tweet that started it was, I said, you know, schools don't exist so we can have jobs. They exist to make kids awesome. And that really kind of was the foundation of what kids deserve. Kids deserve it is. And like every day, like bringing it for kids, leave it all on the field. Um, you know, you have a bad day, you got to leave it in your car at home and you got to bring, bring all the energy. And, uh, I mean, within a year, um, just what, it, it really speaks to people and that's just really, and at its core, it's just really, really simple. Um, and people ask us all the time, like, what is Kids Deserve It? Like, is it a company? Is it like a movement? And we just kind of, we kind of call it a few things, I guess, like an ecosystem. It's a, it's a community. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation. Um. I don't know. Do you, do you want to describe it any other way, Todd? We always think that Kids Deserve It is a place for educators who are tired of allowing others to make excuses or be negative about our profession. Um, both Adam and I are very passionate about sharing the great things that are possible within our system and not letting um, some other voices drown us out of people who just want to complain or talk about things that can't be done. Adam and I believing in doing what's best for kids regardless of how much work it's going to take or what we're going to run into. And so we always just want to make sure that we go out there and spread that message. And other people have really bought in and, and have really helped spread it as well. So I guess we can go ahead and get started with our presentation. Yeah, um, like we it. said, I'm, I'm Todd Nesloni, um, and then Adam's welcome here with me. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about Kids Deserve It and some of the things that we've done and what we believe in and kind of give you more of a glimpse behind the curtain of Kids Deserve It and everything that we've started. Um, so, of course, we want to show you who we are. Um, this is Adam and I. We always feel like, you know, you want to get somebody on your side. You show them cute kid pictures. And so what cuter kid pictures <laughs> than of ourselves? So this is me listening to my mom's 8-track player on the left-hand side, and then Adam. Yeah, this is me as a little gunnery sergeant when I was like three or four years old in my blonde hair. And uh, you know, I grew up in my dad's classroom. He was actually taught second and third grade for about 35 years. So I've been connected to education for a long time. He was also a school board member. So I kind of saw that back end of it too um, and all the political parts of it. And uh, just trying to break down those barriers, like we say, just to do what's best for kids. Yeah, and I grew up in an educator family as well. My mom is a teacher. My aunt was a teacher and principal. My grandmother, my cousins, we all just a bunch of people trying to work with education. So when we think about kids and when we think about education, you know, when I was in the classroom just a couple years ago, um, I went straight from the classroom to a principal job. And so when I left the classroom, I was teaching in a classroom that was fully project-based and flipped. Uh, I was the only teacher in my district who did it when I started, and it was a very scary experience, especially with the parent and student population that wasn't used to change. And if you've ever heard about flipped classroom or project-based learning, it's quite different than the traditional way education is done. And one thing that would often come up when I worked with parents and tried to change their mindset was this phrase on the screen now, is that a chalkboard worked for me, so why isn't it good enough for you? And when I think about um, that phrase, and you know, I had to have many conversations with parents, my comeback was always that what worked for us in the past does not work for us today. And some of the, because parents would come to me and say, can you just send a textbook home? Because I need a textbook for my kid to work if they're going to really learn, because I learn from textbooks. And so when they bring these conversations up, my response back to them is, well, you know, there was a point in time where having no air conditioning was fine and it worked for us. But now we really like air conditioning. Or riding a horse and buggy somewhere was great until cars were invented and then we really liked cars. Our world is changing and changing faster and faster all the time. And so when we work with these people who want to just make excuses on why things shouldn't change, the conversation has to be if you want one piece to change, then you really don't want any of it to change. So we have to look at the whole picture. And so what we really try to encourage uh, parents to do when they come up with this or other teachers who make these comments as well is that those things did work for you and they were great but they don't work in the world that we live in now because now our kids walk out and no matter where they go 
or what they do or what job they want to be a part of, it requires you to have some understanding in technology, to have some collaboration skills, everything, because our world has changed so dramatically. No, I, and I talk about the blockbuster effect. Um, you think about blockbuster videos, and I, I used to have a sign of them in my office and all the, all the store closing, and you know what? They didn't innovate and they didn't change. People stopped renting movies and uh, other companies took over, and I think it's a really great reminder for schools to think about, you know, are, are you blockbuster or, are, or what you're doing in your school, in your district, um, is it still relevant? So that leads into robots, and uh, Todd's got a story about robots, and i got a fun story about spheros. Yeah, so I was doing a lot of work with my kids, and we were sharing out our stuff on social media. And one of my friends, Kevin Honeycutt, who is absolutely amazing, contacted me and was like, I love what your kids are doing in their project-based classroom. He said, I've got this school in Kansas that they're doing some cool project-based stuff too. They're building these hot dog solar cookers. He said, would you like to connect with them and kind of uh, collaborate with them? And I said, sure, let's do it. I said, do you want to set up a Skype or a Google Hangout? And he said, no, those are so boring. He said, you just sit there with one class on one side and one side of the other, and you all just sit and talk to each other. He said, I've got something so much cooler. How about we do this double robotics thing? And it's a robot on a pole with wheels at the bottom. And from Texas, we logged into their iPad and controlled the robot. So we got to roll the robot around. You can see that's my face with my kids all around me on the iPad. And we rolled it around. And instead of sitting and talking about what they were doing, as they were building the hot dog cookers, my kids got to roll the robot around and interview them and talk to them and go from group to group. Then when they took it outside, they got to roll the robot outside and watch them set the cookers up. And then they got to roll it into the principal's office and interview the principal. It was such a cool experience. Now, in all honesty, I tried controlling the robot at first because I was a teacher. I was going to show them how to do it. And within 10 seconds, ran it into a wall. So obviously that didn't work extremely well, but I gave the iPad to a kid. And one of the kids in my class had it down pat right away. And it was kind of one of those reminders to myself that as, as an educator, I can't be afraid of technology because I'm not good at it or I don't know how to do it. A lot of the times, I can just put it in the kids' hands and they'll blow my mind away with how easy they latch on or learn about things. And that's not always the case, but a lot of the times it is. And I think about this robotics thing and how my kids in a tiny town in Texas got to collaborate with kids in Kansas because I was on social media, because I was sharing our story, because I was willing to connect and go past the four walls, and it was great. Adam, are you there? Are you there? Oh, lost you. Where, what, what was the last thing y'all heard? And it was great. So that leads into um, what we do at my school. Um, that we've done for a couple of years with Spheros and robots. You know, I saw the Spiro. If you don't know what a Spiro is, go to just Spiro.com, S-P-H-E-R-O, and um, it was like $100. And I always think about um, access point for kids. And, you know, a lot of people talk about one-to-one -one and taking their school one-to-one, -one, and I blogged about that, and it's such a big mountain and money you need to save and so many different parameters that need to come into place. Well, when I think about robots, $100, but to buy a Spiro and an iPad. And so this image is some of my fourth graders. This is the first time that they're using a Spiro. And the teacher had them program uh, in the iPad. They have to write code in the Spark app. Uh, Tickle is a great app. How to program a, a figure eight, right? And there's a great video that goes along with this. I actually took like 15 minutes of time lapse. And from the first iteration of trying to write the code and make the Spiro go around the cones, to 15 minutes later, they had it figured out. And as Todd said before, put it in the kids' hands. We didn't train them. We didn't show them. We said, here's a Spiro. Here's an app. Program a figure, a, a figure eight. And literally within 15 minutes, they had done it. And something like this, I feel, is always better with a partner. Like working together, um, two brains are better than one. I've had a lot of people ask me, why do you have robots in school, Adam? Well, you know, they're coding, which is math. Uh, thanks for, the, for, for dropping the, in, the, in the link, Peggy. Um, they're collaborating. It's project-based learning to just like the nth degree. It's common core on so many levels. Um, when I got to my school, uh, I'm at a new school this year. In August, I had a sphere of my own, and I really wanted to bring it to my school, so I put it in my office on the floor. And whenever people would walk in, what would they say? What's that? I'm like, I'm glad you asked. I would grab my iPad and uh, drive it around the classroom. So I actually gave it to um, one of my parents to take on vacation for the weekend. 
So what happens when kids take home a Sphero on the weekend? Todd, you want to go to the next slide? They become <laughs> experts. So what we do also now, we have 15 Spheros at my school, and this is not a picture I took. This is a picture that uh, a parent at my school took, and they have one of our Spheros from our school. We send textbooks home. How come we don't send robots and um, laptops and drones home with kids? And this parent said, my son has not been interested in this type of thing before. Literally, we had to like grab it out of his hand. And again, he's working with his sister. He's collaborating. He went on YouTube to Spiro's YouTube channel to learn how to code things in different ways. And what do I have now? I have an expert at my school in fourth grade. So when we introduce Spiro's to third, second graders, what do I do? I don't teach them. I bring Aiden along, and he teaches the kids. And when a, when a student can teach another student, you know they really get it, but they also have just a deeper level of understanding. Their confidence is through the roof. Um, and uh, I think about, I'm about 30 minutes from Google headquarters, and I think about Google driverless car, and I think about Tesla and all their technology, and this is a skill, and this is a job that our kids can have right now, and that in 10, 15 years when they're done with the school, just imagine where it will be. So I feel like starting the conversation and bringing this to students is so, so important. And it's such an easy access point, other than, rather than like buying laptops for your entire school. You have $100, you have an iPad, hand them to the kids and go. All you need to do is create their opportunities and, and they will run with it and take it away. And then, you know, I think about one of the great things that we did that I have so much fun with, and I know Paula has a lot of experience with this too, is mystery Skypes or mystery Google Hangouts. That has been such a fun experience for me to find other classrooms to collaborate with. So if you've never done a mystery Skype or Google Hangout, there's lots of different varieties. But my favorite one to do was to find a classroom and connect with the teacher. And the teacher knew where we were from, and I knew where the teacher's class was from, but our kids had no idea. So they played a game of kind of like 20 questions of are you east of the Mississippi? Does it snow in the winter? Things like that. And we had to guess where each other was from. I did probably about 20 to 30 of these every school year. Um, because it only took about 10 or 15 minutes, super easy to do, and there was not a lot of risk involved. Now, I will say, you know, coming from certain areas, if you are from Texas, one of the best words of advice that I always give is make sure you don't use the word y'all in your mystery Skypes or Google Hangouts, because no matter where you are in the South, if you're not from the South and somebody says y'all, you immediately think Texas. So we have to do a lot of training with our kids about that, um, because a lot of the kids go, well, you know, if I can't say y'all, what do I say instead? And I had to teach them that you guys or you all, things like that. So it was always interesting to hear them when they would get up to the camera to talk. Um, but I love this image that I have here because this was a class in Seattle, Washington, and their teacher is actually the pirate in the back of the room. They were having a pirate learning day. And not only did we do a mystery Google Hangout with them, but he did five wardrobe changes throughout the Hangout. And so my kids were like in awe that this teacher had all these costumes ready to go and was changing. And they were like, why don't you do that? And so it brought in all these other ideas and connections. And it was just a fun experience. Um, but when thinking about mystery Skypes and mystery Google Hangouts and connecting with others, it doesn't have to be something that you do from right across, from across the country or across the world. If you're nervous about connecting um, via Skype or Google Hangout, the easiest way to do it is to do it with a teacher across the hall. Or even, like we did for my first one, we set up two laptops in the same room and just Google Hangout from one end of the room to the other so that we could play with the technology, make sure we know what we're doing, and use all of that. But I did probably 50 Google Hangouts a year, not mystery, but all in all, with different classrooms, educators, different things like that with my students. And none of them ever had to do with the topic that I was teaching. Because I wanted to connect my kids with other experiences and other people from around the world and cultures so that they could have a more well-rounded view as well. So at my last school, I was principal. Um, my entire staff was on Twitter. Um, all 27 teachers were on Twitter, actively tweeting every day. And in, in three years, I was principal at my school. We, we sent 13,000 tweets. So like we were a Twitter school. It just totally changed the culture uh, at the school and the community. And then I started reading a lot of articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, about high schoolers um, having these amazing GPAs, great resumes, and they would apply to college and they wouldn't get in. Because colleges and companies, for that matter now, they are 
um, they are they they are they are they are checking people's social media profiles. So I said, okay, digital citizenship is so important. We have to train our kids. And my dad didn't hand me the keys of the car and said, go learn how to drive. He was sitting right next to me in the in the passenger seat. So I started a program called Social Media Interns, and literally it was it was like the simplest thing that I did. I called two parents of two students who were in fifth grade that I knew really well. Um, they were in student council. I said, hey, I want them to start tweeting with me from our school account. What do you think? And they said, yeah, go for it. So literally later that day, I grabbed two kids. I gave them one of my iPads, and I said, go walk around school and take 15 pictures. Uh, a couple hours, hours later, they came back to my office. We sat down, and we tweeted together from our school account. And the example of my dad sitting next to me in the seat driving, to me, is just this example um, times 10. And I said, here's the hashtags. Here's what you say. Here's what you don't say. You only have 140 characters. This is why we don't take pictures of students' faces right on and first names and last names, what have you. So literally after a day, maybe two days of me training them, they had carte blanche. They would just go around and take pictures and tweet. And every tweet that they sent, they hashtagged kid tweet. So I knew and the community knew that it was a student uh, sharing that picture. So every two weeks, we had two new interns. I did not train the next iteration of interns. My current ones train the next interns. And, they would, and you would see four kids walking around, talking about pictures, uh, talking about angles. And what it did was, you know, I as a principal had a viewpoint of my school and what I saw. And then teachers shared what they saw. But just seeing it from a student's perspective was so interesting because they looked at things in a way that I never would think about. Um, and then it also gave them a voice, which student voice is so powerful. Um, and those kids are now in middle school. So they are going to be on social media at some point, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Snapchat, whatever it is. And hopefully the work that we did and that we continue to do with interns is going to help them um, think about uh, being respectful and um, appropriate on social media when they get older so it doesn't impact their life. Social media of my generation was a post-it note, and I would write something on the post-it note maybe, or somebody else would, and it ended up in the garbage can, or maybe three people read it. Well, nowadays, uh, the Library of Congress is um, archiving every tweet ever sent, and like that's a really profound on people's lives. So uh, showing kids the right way um, with me was such a powerful experience and something that I will always remember and always do um, as a school leader. Well, and you know, when I thought about my classroom, and one of the things that I did is I got to, I had the opportunity to visit the Ron Clark Academy a few years ago, and then again a few weeks ago, um, and one of the things that Kim Bearden and Ron Clark both talk about at the Academy is providing these experiences for kids they won't forget, doing these classroom transformations, because as we all know, our memories, our real memories are built in emotional experiences. They're not built in rote memorization. And so when you think from your past about the things you remember the most, it's because it was a really happy memory or really upsetting memory. And so we have to kind of build that same kind of thing for kids. We can't just focus on this idea of worksheets and trying to make it fun like that. And then I think about Dave Burgess's book, Teach Like a Pirate, which is one of my favorite books ever. And in that book he talks about would people pay a dollar to come to your class. If they wouldn't pay a dollar to come to your class, then you're doing something wrong. We should be creating classrooms that kids are paying money to get into. And so when I came back from that, I took the idea and ran with it in my classroom and transformed my classroom into the Nez Hospital. We were learning about different math and measurements, and so what I did was I covered the walls in plastic wrap, I covered the tables, I got plastic bins, I got bags of blood, aka red dyed water, and put parasites, also known as gummy worms, in there. I got masks, gloves, hairnets, borrowed the aprons from the high school chemistry department, and transformed this whole room for $35 at Dollar Tree. It was not a big expense. And so that day, they were a part of new doctors and a new doctor training program. And I came dressed differently. I had an accent. I had a sub pass and all these kind of ideas. And I introduced myself as Dr. Nesbitt, and they totally bought in and played along. And so for that whole day, we did different activities based on um, things that would have been at a hospital and part of a training program. And it was one of those things that this was four or five years ago, and I still have students contacting me telling me that was the best thing they ever did and how much fun it was. And I remember doing it around December, and then every single week for the rest of that school year, the kids would ask me when Dr. Nesbitt was coming back. And I was like, are you kidding me? I am Dr. Nesbitt. I'm here every day. 
But it was one of those experiences they just bought into so much that there were a couple of my fifth graders who believed that it was someone else that was there for today, that day, which I found so hilarious that that happened. But one thing that I try to encourage with my teachers and staff now is to continually try to build these experiences. And an idea I can think of this week, if you check out our Twitter account or even our, our school hashtag, which is web, W-E-B-B-E-L-E-M for elementary, we had two of our teachers that went and transformed their classrooms into a campground. They had a, a, a fire with logs and these little a light with a little paper. They had a tent set up, a kayak with water, um, a, a hammock, all this stuff. And the kids learned all of their material in a first grade classroom through being on a camping trip. It was amazing. And it was one of those things that I know the kids aren't going to forget anytime soon. And I guarantee you the learning that happened that day was at such more of a depth than any other day that they've had where it's just your typical tra traditional learning. And that is something that's important. I mean, when we design these fun days, we don't design them to be fluffy and cute and just a, cra a crazy day. They are grounded in the standards and grounded in depth and complexity so that there's real value and real learning that's happening here. But if you haven't checked out any of those three people I mentioned, Kim Bearden has a book, Crash Course. Loved it. That was our staff book this year. Dave Burgess's Teach Like a Pirate. And Ron Clark has like four or five books and all of them are amazing. I guarantee you'll love any of them that you check out. Another thing that we talked about, that I talked about was a math fair. Um, and, and that was a really great thing for us to do as well, just because I really got to really work with kids and their passions and, um, and, and build upon those passions. And instead of doing a science fair, they got to pick anything they wanted from the math, from anything they wanted they were passionate about, and design a project that had three visuals and at least five facts on how their passion was brought in um, and how, where, where the math was involved. And it was one of those nights that was just an absolutely incredible transformative experience um, that uh, the kids got to just show math in their passions. Another great idea and activity. You know, when we think about um, schools motivating students, um, um, I think about, we think about athletes a lot, and Todd's going to talk about classroom champions in a minute. But I remember when I was a student, I grew up as a Giants fan, and uh, Roger Craig was, was a manager of, of the San Francisco Giants for a long time, and he just had a great way of motivating people and had these sayings, uh, home baby, and you got to love those kids, and the whole team rallied around. Uh, Hunter Pence is an outfielder for the Giants, and he's kind of the locker room person that just really brings the team together. Uh, well, being in the Bay Area, we have the Golden State Warriors in our backyard, and, um, you know, they have the most winning season ever this year, uh, world champions. And if you come onto my campus right now, Steph Curry is, like, everywhere on jerseys, socks. Uh, I play basketball with kids, um, and uh, – at a recess, and I'm always like talking about Steph Curry. So what do kids do now? They're like, Mr. Welcome, uh, take a picture of our jerseys all together and tweet Steph Curry, or uh, put them on Instagram. And I've been I've been tweeting and in, uh, Insta with uh, with Steph all year long. He literally lives like 10 minutes from my school. I'm like, hey, stop by any time and and play basketball. And you know, athletes really get kids pumped up um, to to get excited about school, to work harder. Um, and uh, Todd has done a lot of work with Classroom Champions uh, in the past that he wants to talk about. Yeah, so Classroom Champions, if you have not heard of it, it's an amazing free resource, classroomchampions.org. Um, what they do is they connect top performing athletes with schools, and they uh, have all these videos online for you to take and learn from these athletes about goal setting, fair play, teamwork, all of these things that we as educators pull in as part of our learning experience. And I had the pleasure a few years ago of being a Classroom Champions teacher. And what that means is I get everything that's on for, online for free, but I get an athlete specifically assigned to my class. And so this picture here, I love this photo because our class actually won a contest, and our athlete, who is Paralympian Josh Sweeney, got to come visit our school. And Josh was a, a Paralympian. He, were, he fought in the war in Afghanistan, stepped on an IED, lost both of his legs, came back, joined the men's sled hockey team, and then went with them to Sochi, Russia, as they were in the Paralympics, and he scored the only goal that helped the USA win the gold medal um, for sled hockey. So it was quite an exciting year for my kids to get to follow him, and then to have him come and share his journey with my students in person, many of which had never seen this, uh, anybody that had lost limbs or had any kind of disability. It was a powerful emotional experience. I mean, one of the biggest things that I took from his uh, his visitation was, you know, one of my kids said, are you angry you don't have legs? And he looked at them and he said, why would I be angry? If I had legs, I would not be an Olympic gold medalist right now. 
He said, you can choose to be upset and angry about the things that happen in your life, or you can choose to use them as a springboard to do good and to continue moving your life forward. And for many of my students, where almost 90% of them come from a home of poverty and don't think they can escape that or don't think they can escape the drugs, the gangs, the violence, it's, it's encouraging for them to see someone who has gone through physical turmoil and pain and still come out better on the other end. So it's definitely one of those huge, powerful experiences for my students. Another thing that I talk a lot about with people is being on social media and sharing your learning and your journey and the power that exists within that. I never thought that I would be someone who would be on Twitter sharing everything going on in my class in my school. But because of it, these on this page are just a few examples of the things that we have been able to be a part of because we share our story. My fourth graders were sharing out all this great stuff they were learning about STEM. And the White House tweeted us back and said, hey, we've got this STEM webinar coming up. We need some kids to ask questions. It's going to be with six Miss America contestants, including Miss America herself. Could you pull some fourth graders together? And I was like, yeah, the White House is asking. Of course I could. So even though we didn't have any fancy equipment, we had a laptop set up on a counter, we tilted down, that all my kids had to squeeze around so that they could be on the call. We got to work with the White House because we were sharing our story online. Same thing with National Geographic. They saw some great work that we were doing, and I did a webinar with them, and they sent us a National Geographic explorer who came and talked about her travels around the world and the experience that she's got to have as a young learner as well. And then, of course, Kim Bearden again. I mentioned my staff using her book as a book study this year, the Crash Course book. And it was such a moving book that my teachers, we did a Crash Course day where we implemented all of the stuff that we learned from the book in one day. Well, when Kim saw the great work that we were doing and the fact that everybody was buying in, she came down for that day and surprised my staff and spent a day with them seeing all of the great activities that they did. And these are things that would not have happened if we were not sharing our story and putting ourselves out there and letting everybody see the great things that can truly happen in education. We, were, uh, we, we uh, also like to often talk about, do you like where you work? And I know we were going to show a video here, but we're going to go ahead and bypass that video, um, Peggy and Lori. Um, but this is a great video that we have that we share often on our social media accounts. And it just talks to the passion of, you have to love where you work. And you've got to let others see that love for you. And I love this video because this man does a dance of magic, he calls it, into work every day. Because he's so excited to be there and to be around the people that he works with. And I showed this to my staff and talked about how we need to be in an environment that shares our love for our kids and our work. And I had a teacher last year who did a dance of magic every single day when he came in to the school and put it on Instagram. And all the kids were following him. All the kids loved it. And it was just a great way to show how much we love coming to work. And, you know, Todd and I talk about doing whatever for kids and whatever for our campus. And we love this collage that we put together of us just getting in, getting in and getting dirty uh, with the kids. Uh, my favorite thing to do as principal is to ride the tricycles. And the first time you ride tricycles in the kindergarten yard, kids look at you like you are crazy. And then what do they do? They hop on the tricycles and they start following you. And the next day, all the parents come up to, you, uh, come up to me and say, uh, hey, my, my kid said that you were riding the tricycles in kindergarten? And I was like, yeah, um, it's super fun. Uh, and then, you know, when, when, uh, when a teacher on campus uh, has cancer, everybody wears pink. And, you know, I wear a pink wig to support that teacher. Uh, I dug a hole with an excavator uh, to plant a tree. Um, and every month um, I read a book to classes, uh, the same book to, uh, to every class on campus. And, uh, you know, we always choose a book that, that fits with our, our character of the month theme. Uh, last week, last month was inclusion. This month is honesty. And to go back to what Todd said with tweeting people, you know, we tweet authors um, all the times of the all the time of the books. Peter Reynolds, uh, Kelly DiPuccio, uh, Andrea Beatty, and they write back. And the kids, I'll show the kids the message, and they're just so uh, so excited that. That the um, that the authors write back is just is just so profound. All the kids ask me daily, "Are you going to read to us? Are you going to read to us?" And just connecting with kids uh, with with literature and, and books is, is just so powerful and just such a powerful um, part of the job that that we do as leaders. And you know, when I thought about taking this job as a principal and coming straight out of the classroom, I was so nervous about losing my connection with kids and being one of those traditional principals who always is in the office and everybody is like, oh my gosh, what do they really do? And then when I met with the superintendent of my district that I'm working at now, I said, you know, one of the things that I want to do is I want to be different, just like Adam just talked about. I don't want to be traditional. And I said, I still want to teach. I still want to do all kinds of things. And you know, I'm doing that. 
second year as a principal, every single day, my entire administration staff has morning duty, lunch duty, and afternoon duty. I do tutoring groups every day, before school, after school, or during school, with one of those three. I still do teach classes. I still do some Saturday school here and there. I cover teachers' classrooms so they can have breaks just when I know it's been a rough day. I love going to PE and recess like Adam talked about and playing with kids and letting them see you as much more than just authoritarian figure who sits in the office. Because I guarantee you when you get out there and you're involved in the classrooms and you're still teaching lessons and you're still modeling things and you're still doing all of these kind of activities, your staff comes together so much more because they see the principals down there in the trenches with them and not somebody who's just the head that everybody has to listen to. And for me, it's allowed me a connection into the classroom that I feel like I've never left because I'm still in the classrooms every single day. I, I got students in my school that call me Adam. And uh, I, I take it as a badge of honor that, uh, you know, there's only a few, uh, but that they feel that comfortable with me. Like, they know where they stand with me but they feel that comfortable to call me Adam um, because you know what? We are. I'm just part of the team. I, I don't really see myself as part of the, as the principal. I see myself just part, as part of the team. And, you know, Todd and I talk a lot about tearing down walls. Um, and I have four special day classes on my campus, special education. And in my last school I did as well. And, you know, one day it kind of hit me, like, I, I don't see a lot of those parents um, because a lot of those students ride the bus to school. We don't have busing for all my students um, in our area, usually only for, for students that are in special education. So I decided to ride the bus. And I met the bus driver at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, I started this three years ago. And we went around and picked up the students. And I told the bus driver, but I didn't tell any of the students or any of the parents. Uh, and when the principal gets off the bus and walks up to your front door to greet you, to then walk you to the bus, like the relationships that were built were so profound. We were able to one student was on the bus for an hour and a half in the morning. And if I hadn't ridden the route, I wouldn't have figured this out. But we changed the route with two simple things, and the student only spent 10 minutes on the bus. So they were able to sleep in longer, spend more time at home. Uh, this year, I rode the bus, and one of my bus drivers has been driving for 25 years. And she said, Adam, you're the first principal in 25 years to ride the bus. And I say that because not enough principals are riding the bus. And just the relationships um, that are built and that can happen and the connections with kids and parents is, is just so profound. Kids still look at me, and I, I did it this year about three months ago, and they said, Mr. Welcome, you rode the bus earlier this year. And I said, I know. And after school, I get on the bus. Uh, we have three of them, and I make sure all the kids are all set, ready to go. And they ask me, are you going to ride home with us? And I say, no, not today. You know, I did that a few, a few months ago, but maybe I will before the end of the year. But, um, you know, it really spoke to the kids, and they really got impact from it. So to me, that tells me, you know, those actions were really profound and really important. And, you know, one of the things that we try to do at my school is really get parents involved. And like I said earlier, I work with uh, families that are 90% of them are on uh, below the poverty line. And so it's really hard to get families involved when they have several jobs, when they have all these things going on. And I thought, you know, no matter how much inviting we do to come into the school, we still can't get people to come into the school. And I thought about my work in my youth with missions work and how we don't beg people to come into places. We go to them. And so as a school, that's what we try to do now, is we try to go to our community. And so once every couple of months, we go out into our local apartment complexes, and we bring a big barbecue pit grill, and we partner with the junior high. And all we do is we bring hot dogs and chips and drinks, and we grill hot dogs and share it with the families at the apartment complexes. And I love it so much because people get in line, and they're like, why are you doing this? And I say, because we love you, and that's the only reason why. We don't pass out pamphlets. We don't beg for volunteers. We don't ask parents to read 20 minutes every night with their kids. We just go out there and show the parents and families that we care about them on a level that is deeper than a butt in a chair or a number on a page, that their families mean something to us, so much so that we're coming after hours to do this, that we're giving up of our own materials and money and things like that. And this has been huge in tearing down a lot of the walls in our community and allowing families to see that we truly do care about them and their children. So when we started Kids Deserve It, we started with a blog and with a Twitter, and we would tweet out just little, um, little quotes that we came up with. We had friends that would do this, and then we started these things that uh, we call Canvas. And we, um, you know, 90% of these quotes are, are, are unique from Todd and I, and we've used some from authors. And we've had so many educators reach out to us from all over the world that say, oh my gosh, those daily quotes and the images, they just, you know, they, they light a little spark when I'm having a tough day. We all have those days. Um, they, they're really exciting to me, and they really speak to me. Uh, we've gotten pictures from people 
that have printed these off and put them in their staff room. Um, it's just, it's really profound and we just really love uh, the message that they send because, you know, sometimes just a little quote in an image of a, of a, of a child can really turn your day around. Um, you can find all of these on our website um, under Canva um, and, you know, feel free to print them off, share them, tweet them, put them on Instagram. You know, they're really just, they're really meant as a way just to kind of bring you back um, and also just to push you forward if you need it. And so we wanted to show this video to you because we think that, you know, our jobs as educators are so important and sometimes we forget the impact we truly leave on people. And so, Peggy, do one of y'all go ahead and play the video? Evening. Evening. May I ring that up for you? Yes, please. Have a good evening. Tubbs, I read your book. You read my book? Mm -hmm. Barman, give that man a bell. <laughs> <laughs> We love sharing that video, mainly because <laughs> if you've never seen that before, you probably are like tearing up and crying and then you realize, oh my gosh, it's a Scotch commercial. I just <laughs> cried at a Scotch commercial. Um, but I think that video is so powerful because it really does show the power that all of us as educators have um, and what we truly do is as educators, we change lives. We do so much more than just provide a basic education for people. And so I think if that's why, you know, this video is such an encapsulation of what Kids Deserve It stands for because kids deserve the best from us all the time. And one of mine and Adam's favorite quotes is the one that's on the screen now, that adults need to have fun so children will want to grow up. Because why would they want to be anything like us if we look miserable, if we hate our job, or if we provide something that we can't... Um, that they don't want to be. And so this is one of the quotes that Adam and I both live by, is just having that great idea and attitude. And Adam? Yeah, it's never too late um, to, to inspire people. It's never too late to do your best. You know, uh, I see a lot of things on Twitter right now. It's like uh, there's 20 days of school left, you know, capitalize on every day. It's like the reverse of a countdown. Like we get to be together 20 more days. So uh, I like to, I, I love sports analogies and Leave it on the field every day, day in, day out. Um, you know, who will you inspire? I, our kids do deserve the best. I'm a dad. Even before I was a dad, um, I felt that way. But then having my own kids really, um, <laughs> really brought it to another, another level. So, you know, we, uh, we encourage everybody to, uh, to use the hashtag kids deserve it. Um, we have actually have a t-shirt campaign. I dropped the link in earlier. We sell kids deserve it t-shirts. Uh, and Todd and I a long time ago, Always, always knew that we wanted to, you know, wanted to give back. So we actually donate all the proceeds from our, uh, our from our T-shirt drives back to education. Donors choose grants. Um, we've already donated about thirty-five hundred dollars. Um, this next campaign is over in ten days, and we're going to do the same. Uh, we have six colors right now. Um, after this one is over, so um, you know, uh, just looking for uh, looking for inspiration. The hashtag follow us on kids deserve it. 
Um, and we also com. have our book coming out in a couple yes, weeks, we um, in just a couple weeks. So it will be out by June. Um, but, so we encourage you to kind of follow along and check out our blog and all of our social media because we will be sharing all the ways that you can connect and some great exciting um, giveaways and things that we have coming up leading to the book. We also encourage you all to check out our website which also has our Blab show that we do on a pretty much weekly basis where we interview people in, in education who are doing inspiring or creative things. So thank you uh, Classroom 2.0 Live for having us on. We really appreciate it. I don't know if there's any questions or Peggy, what y'all want to go from here? That I caught in the chat has already been answered. Um, someone recognized Todd's name from uh, actually being on Classroom 2.0 Live before. So that that's right. that was the only question I had was, was Todd actually here before? And you were. So if anybody, if anybody does have a question for either Todd or Adam, Paula raised her hand. Um, I'll go ahead and go ahead, Paula. Hi, I have a question for Todd or something I'd like him to share with us. Uh, Todd, would you um, tell everyone about your Dinner with the Gentleman initiative that you just ran? Uh, yes. So that was my favorite part of this entire school year. So I talked about tearing down walls and us going out in the community. But one of the other big initiatives for this school year has been to get fathers and father figures involved. And I know a lot of schools do a donuts with dad kind of thing. And so we had a big watchdogs kickoff event where we had pizza and we invited dads to come and watchdogs seeks to get dads to volunteer time in school. Well, we had out of our 750 students, we had two dads show up for our kickoff event. And that was back in October or November. And I said, this isn't working. We, we've got to figure out something different. And so when we thought about the Donuts with Dad event that so many schools do, I said, you know, we really can't do that because our facilities don't work with that very well about being able to house all those parents. And so I said, let's think of something better. Let's really go all out for these dads because I want them to be here and I want them to know just how important they are. So working with my, uh, my buddies, um, Ben Gilpin and, and Brad Gustafson, who are principals in Michigan and Minnesota, they helped give a couple of ideas. Adam helped give a couple of ideas. And I went to one of my assistant principals, Aaron Marvel, and I got with him and I said, okay, I think we can do this. Let's do a dinner. And I said, I don't want to call it dinner with dad because so many of our kids do not live with their fathers. They live with un uncles, grandmas, uh, grandfathers, step uncles, step everything. So I said, let's do something different. And so I said, let's call it dinner with a gentleman. And they can bring any male figure in their life. And I said, let's go all out. Let's cater the dinner. Let's provide a book for every single kid that comes. Let's have three guest speakers. Let's have a student panel. Let's do all of this and just celebrate dads for a night. And I said, well, if we're going to do catering, we've got to do um, an RSVP thing. I said, so when I call the caterer, I'll say 150. I'll dream big for this since we only had two come to the last thing. Well, 630 RSVPs later, <laughs> it was a little bit we had to change catering, go with a whole other idea, but we had about 580 actually show up of fathers, figures, and kids. And we had some guest speakers, like I said, a student panel. Every kid loved the book so they could continue the conversation at home with their dads. It was such a neat experience. I've never walked into a room full of close to 600 people and had it be all the men in those kids' lives. No moms anywhere. And that's a powerful statement to those kids to see those men show up. And I'm getting emotional now talking about it again because, I mean, it's just such a neat thing. And I had some moms call me later and they're like, when are you going to do something for moms? And I was like, oh, it's coming. We're going to do something else for moms. It won't be quite as big because our focus was dads this year. But one of the moms called and she said, I want to tell you that she said that was the best thing the school's ever done. And I said, why? And she said, I can't get my husband to go to anything. She said, he just doesn't want to be at that school for anything, any at education at all. She said, but he... My, he had been talking about this for over a week, and my little girl would not let him not go. And he came home and said, honey, I want to volunteer there for a day. And that to me was like, we got him. We hooked him in. If we can just get him for a day and have these kids see these men on campus, then we've got him. So thanks for asking, Paula. Thanks so much for sharing that. It gives me goosebumps every time I hear that story. Adam, I have a question for you. I think you took part in something that had to do with post-it notes in your school. Yeah, you know, we did a positive post-it note. I got that idea from Todd. 
actually, um, and some other principles. Um, Todd did it a hundred times more than I did, but uh, you, you share a, a positive post-it note, and uh, it takes about, what, four seconds, five seconds to write uh, a positive note on a, um, on a post-it note. And uh, we put them in uh, teachers' boxes, put them on teachers' doors, uh, students did them, did them for each other. Uh, you know, actually, something that I've done for years that is similar is 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 that is that is that positive phone call home. And uh, you know, when the when the principal calls, they hear your voice. Like parents' hearts stop. Um, I've been making positive phone calls home for so for so long for so many years, and parents have always said, "Oh my gosh, like I thought my kid was in trouble." So what I started do, doing is I would give out index cards at a staff meeting, and I would say, "Here's an index card." write down a student's name, something that they did was positive, and you call home. If you want me to call, I'll call. About nine times out of ten, teachers give me the business card, the index card. I come back to my office, I close the door, and I will make about 30 calls a month. Um, it is so, so powerful. Um, and I always play it up. I was like, hey, this is Mr. Welcome. Um, I'm just calling about Johnny. Pause. What is the parent thinking? Right? And then I say, he did such an awesome job today on his writing assignment. I read the whole thing. He was so excited. And always the parent says, oh my gosh, I thought he was in trouble. You made my day. I've had parents calling me crying for the phone call. They played the voicemail. If I don't get people, I, I leave a voicemail. They played it for their entire office because they're so proud. Like we don't celebrate enough in edu education. We have to celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. So calling home and as simple as a post-it note is so, so powerful. Thank you, Adam, for sharing that. Um, I'm planning a positive post-it note in my classroom um, before the end of the school year. Also, have either of you ever done, instead of a uh, call to a parent, have you ever called a teacher into your office and called either their mom, dad, or spouse? <laughs> yes, actually. You know, we, we have done that several times this year in my school because we recognize kids just like Adam does. And I thought we need to be recognized in teachers too. And so I give hats off cards to kids and so do teachers. So I was like, I'm going to give hats off cards to um, some teachers. And so I've been given hats off cards. And when they come into my office to get their card, I say, who do you want to call? And they say, what do you mean? Every time. And I'm like, do you want to call your mom, your husband, your wife? What? And so we go and call. And I do it exactly like I do like Adam said with his kids. I say, hey, so-and-so, I'm Todd Nisling, the principal. I don't know if you know, but your child or your spouse works at my school. And they'll say, yes. And I was like, well, they're up here in my office right now, but it's for great reasons. <laughs> and then I share it. Um, and it's just such a fun and funny experience for an for, uh, uh, older parent to sit there and say, thank you for calling and celebrating my child who works at your school. Um, because really, reality is, people have asked me all the time, do you ever miss working with kids? And I say, you know what, as a teacher, I mean, as a principal, I'm still working with kids. They're just a lot bigger kids. And that's all adults are, just really big kids. And I think about that when I present, when I talk to people, is that that's really all we are. And if we try to act any difference, because we've hidden our kid instincts and our kid, kid selves. And so we really try to bring that fun and that whimsy back in. And a lot of that comes from Brad Montag and Kid President and some work we've done with them, too, about how just bringing back the whimsy and letting kids see that you, can, you don't ever really have to grow up completely. You can still keep your imagination and your creativity. So yes, I love calling the parents or the spouses of work, coworkers of mine. You know, it's really fun. I'll be in a classroom and I'll see a kid do something awesome, and I'll take him, I'll take them, him or her, with me right away, and go to my office. And as we're walking up, they're like, "What did I do?" I said, "You did something awesome. We're gonna go call your parents." And I'll put the I'll call on speakerphone, and I'll say, "Hey, I, I have your I have your child here with me." Um, I said, they want to tell you something, and then I'll have them tell their parent on speakerphone what they did in class, and then I'll, I'll drop in and tell them what's going on, and like, it's just such a fun thing, and literally it takes like three minutes. You give a high five, and they go back to class. Like, how can that not feel, make somebody feel good? Like, as principals, I feel that is, those are the exact things that we should be doing on a daily basis, and you really can only do that if you're visible. Um, if you're in classrooms, if you're at recess, if you're at morning duty, lunch duty, after school duty, like Todd talks about, just being on the ground floor and connecting with kids. Um, other principals hear about it, teachers see it, and they know that you're there for the right reasons. A question did come in, and this was during the, uh, the dinner for gentlemen talk. Uh, how did you end up paying for that? You said it was a catered dinner for quite a number of people. Yes. So 
we, uh, first of all, we have some funds in our title account that uh -huh. is specifically for community and parent engagement. So we're able to use some of those funds. But we also reached out to some of the large corporations and businesses mm -hmm. in our community. And when you share as a school that you're trying to get dads involved and all you need is a little help with the, fun, with the food, they mm -hmm. jump all over it. And it's really easy. The worst thing you can ever do is not ask for help. Thanks. Okay. I think those were the only questions I was able to capture. It's probably about time to wrap up. Thanks so much for coming to the show today and, and sharing all of these ideas. And I'm going to turn over the mic to Peggy now. Thank you, Todd and Adam. That was so inspiring. And I cannot wait to get this recording published so we can share it with people who weren't able to join us today. I know that they're looking forward to it. And that should get published later today. So I'll tweet it out when it's all ready to go so all of you can share it too. We hope you'll come back every Saturday when we have a show to join us because we have some of the best educators around coming to share their stories, their passions, and exciting tools and ideas with us. Next week on May 14th, we have a great featured teacher coming. His name is Nate Balcom, and he is the organizer of the March Book Madness pro Project, plus he's done a lot of other student projects. So we're going to get to hear all about how this year's March Book Madness went. So I hope that you'll join us for that. Then do want to let you know that there are going to be the next two weeks that we won't have our own show because on Saturday, May 21st, actually for three days, the 4T virtual conference is taking place. And that's from the University of Michigan. And Liz Kolb is one of the chief organizers of that conference. It is always awesome. So the link is in the live binder. Check it out. You have to sign in. It's totally free. But you have to sign in so you can get access to all the links to the schedule and to join the sessions. So I hope you'll join me for that. And then we won't have a show on May 28th because that is the Memorial Day holiday in the United States. But we'll be back at the beginning of June with more shows. So please come back and join us. This is a slide for the May 21st, 23rd virtual conference, the virtual conference that will uh, take place in a couple weeks. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered together all of his resources at one place, including host your own webinar. And you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate Room just like this one. And as long as your event is public, it's free. You can also nominate a featured teacher, like we're going to have a featured teacher next week by filling out this form. And the form's in the Live Binder as well in the Resources section. Also is the survey link as you exit the session. The survey page should open in your browser. Uh, the link will also be in the chat box. At the bottom of that survey, you can request a professional development certificate that now prints out with your name. Please make sure you use a personal email address for this request. School email addresses tend to block these. The video and audio collections are also on iTunes U, as well as still RSS feed on the Classroom 2.0 Live website, including the full recording. So there are many places to get access to past show archives. Special thanks to Todd Nesloni and Adam Welcome, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>